A self unloader is what the name suggests, a vessel that can unload itself. So what is the history of self unloaders? How do they work? And what are the different types? It was in 1902 when a self unloading ship became a reality. This ship was the 220 foot Hennepin. Originally, the ship was a straight decker, meaning it had no self unloading equipment. But when it was bought by the Lakeshore Stone Company, it was fitted with a conveyor system and unloading boom. The ship was used to transport stone from the quarry the company owned to their stone crushing plant. The quarry had been bought by the company in the late 1890s, along with hiring Towner Webster to design a stone crushing plant. Due to the plant's closer vicinity to the water than a railroad, the stone was transported using a ship. The success of converting the Hennepin was so significant that the company converted another freighter in 1908, that being the Topeka. Additionally, other fleets started adding self unloaders to their fleets. The first of these ships was the Wyandotte of the Wyandotte Transportation Company. The ship was built in 1908 at the Great Lakes Engineering Works of Eckhorst, Michigan, as the first ship purpose built as a self unloader. The next year, another self-unloading vessel was added to the fleet, that being the Alpina. The Calcite Transportation Company also built the self-unloader Calcite in 1912, and the Limestone Transportation Company built the WF White in 1915. The 1923-built Glenelg would be the first Canadian self-unloader. But there were two drawbacks in self-unloaders that kept other shipping companies hesitant about self-unloading vessels. One was the weight of the hoppers and conveyors necessary for self-unloading the vessel. The other was the amount of space that these two things took up. They cut back on cargo space, which meant that vessels with these systems could no longer carry as much cargo. But self-unloaders could unload faster which resulted in more trips during the season, and also meant that companies with these ships didn't have to pay for shore-based unloading systems, like the hullet unloading machine. But just the thought of losing hold space was enough for many shipping companies to continue building and using straight-decked bulk freighters. Some companies experimented with above-deck unloading systems so as to not lose hold space. One of these ships was the American, of the American Sand and Gravel Company. Built in 1921, the ship featured a deck-mounted trestle supporting a rail which a clamshell bucket was suspended from. This clamshell bucket would lift the vessel's cargo of sand onto a conveyor belt on top of a 100-foot boom. In 1924, a Canadian vessel, Collier No. 1, was built with a similar system to that of the American. But both of these ships had drawbacks. These systems were heavy and would get in the way of loading chutes. To combat this problem, the Collier No. 1 was refitted with a new system in 1925, featuring arms that could move out of the way when the vessel was loading. Another form of self-unloading was deck-mounted cranes. These cranes were less bulky and more versatile than other above-deck and loading systems. These cranes could be rigged with clamshell buckets, magnets, slings, etc. One system, aboard the barge Marquise Rowan, featured a quite unique unloading system. The barge had both cranes and conveyor systems. The Rowan had two 15-foot hopper cars alongside the starboard side. The cranes would lift the cargo and drop it into the hopper cars, which emptied it onto the unloading boom. Another interesting unloading system was on board the Ralph Missiner. The Missiner was built in 1968 for Scott Missiner steamships. The ship had an 850-ton elevator complex that traveled along the deck with a bucket-slash-chain excavator and two unloading booms. 
the bucket slash chain would scoop ore out of the cargo holds and onto one of the two 60-foot unloading booms. The ship could unload 4,000 tons an hour. The system was known as the Conflow Automatic Unloading System and was designed and built in Germany. But the size of it made it hard to maintain, and it went unused after just three years, eventually being removed in 1977. In the 1980s, many vessels on the lakes were being converted into self-unloaders, but some were left as straight deckers, and as a result, would go to the scrapyard or layup. Currently, on the lakes, self-unloading ships are the norm. Only a few straight deckers operate on the lakes today. On the Great Lakes, there are two main types of self-unloading systems, a bucket lift unloader and a gravity-fed unloader. Both systems start with the same process of opening gates at the bottom of the cargo hold. The cargo then drops into the conveyor belt from the sloped cargo hold. From here is where they differ. With the bucket lift system, the conveyor belt is dropped onto an incline belt, which drops the cargo onto a transfer belt that then drops it onto the bucket elevator. This lifts the cargo to the deck level and drops it onto the unloading boom and then to the shore. With a gravity fit system, the cargo is dropped onto a conveyor belt that sandwiches the cargo between another conveyor belt and lifts it to the deck level and drops it onto the unloading boom and eventually onto the shore. Most self unloaders on the lakes can unload four to 6,000 tons per hour this reduces the amount of time in ports from the typical one day for a straight decker to six to ten hours, typically. Although most self unloaders use an unloading boom typically around 250 feet in length, three ships, the Edgar B. Spear, Roger Blau, and Stuart J. Court, use shuttle booms. These systems are much the same, except the boom is much smaller in size, at about 60 feet in length. The shuttle booms simplified the flow of the cargo and minimized the amount of spillage in the unloading process. But since the shuttle booms are shorter, the amount of ports that unloading is possible at is limited. But since these ships were purpose-built for mainly hauling iron ore to ports with shoreside hoppers, this wasn't an issue. But overall, self-unloaders are a huge part of Great Lakes maritime history and a huge time saver for the industry. Anyways, subscribe for more shipping information videos, and I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye.